want to invite up uh, Jonathan Schreiber from TechCrunch. We're honored to have him here as the moderator. George and Alper, you're going to get introduced probably by Jonathan. Thank you, guys. And happy that they have beers. We're going to keep them filled. Yeah, uh, thank you all for sticking around. Uh, hopefully we've saved at, at least the, the nominal not worst for last. Um, I've got two esteemed gentlemen with me, one of whom worked in a jet propulsion library for, uh, laboratory for NASA, and the other one's won, um, I think the technical term is a shit ton of Academy Awards, right? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. a shit ton. <laughs> um, like more than three, right? Yeah. Yeah, but let's be humble. George and Alper, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Alper is from uh, Volumental, which does 3D imaging um, for uh, clothing and retail. And George is, uh, is in transition to a bunch of new things, which hopefully he'll be able to tell us about. Um, so let's start it off. When you think about um, the visual learning space, uh, or the visual space, visualization, it's a technology that's been around for a while. So as a new startup, how do you differentiate yourselves? How do you stand out from the crowd when there's been so much research and deep technology uh, that's been developed around this stuff? Mm, yeah, so I think uh, one way to sort of answer that is that sure, there has been a lot of technological <laughs> like advancements and stuff, but that doesn't really translate into successful products. Right. Uh, and uh, sort of today's hot new tech is tomorrow's GitHub repo story. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's a given. I mean, and that's especially true in computer vision, in software. Mm -hmm. So whatever that is sort of today closed, we can't talk about it, right. but we had uh, a bajillion amount of uh, investment and so on. When, once it's released, someone will reverse engineer it, right. put it on GitHub, and right. then that's it. Uh, so the, the real value, I think, in, in computer vision it's kind of counterintuitive, but it's it's like since it's like all good problems in life are MP complete and all all good things are co counterintuitive. Right. But the 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 good way of uh, building a computer vision company is not to call yourself a computer vision company, sort of. Well, it's about the application. Uh, then. Yeah, it's not yeah. about it's not about the technology itself. You can have the wizziest, bangiest, newest exactly. technology, but if you're not solving a real use case, right? Then what the hell's the point? Now yeah. you heard nobody believes computer vision works, right? The moment it works, they call it <laughs> something else. So. No, well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so um, how is that? Important? impacted th this sort of tension between the technology and the application. How has that impacted the way that you've thought about your own business, George, and, and the way that you, you're sort of transitioning? Absolutely. I mean, I have great stories. I, um, <laughs> I worked in, my background is vis in visual effects, actually. Uh, Steve and I go a long way back, and um, what you showed today um, that's done at Microsoft is, was kind of our dream back in 1996 when we um, worked on the first Matrix movie. There were these scenes called bullet time that we were challenged to make, and um, we had no idea how we were going to do them. So we looked at different ways of technology, and John Gator, the visual effects supervisor, challenged us to capture the scenes exactly like Steve showed us today. This was in 1996. Wow. And we were supposed to film with multiple film cameras, capture Keanu Reeves, <laughs> dodging bullets, whatnot, and then be able to replay back those scenes in the movie in the slow motion that someone showed earlier. Yeah. Well, we looked at this for months, and the technology just wasn't there. So we ended up on the first movie uh, deploying an approach with still cameras, and then for the background, we used photographs. But uh, long story short, it all goes for a circle. I like change. I am in technology. I live applied it in movies and video games, and then six years ago, I decided to apply it all fashion e-commerce. So I got involved with a startup. I was a CDO for six years. We wanted to do um, the virtual fit mm. technology. So uh, let's telescope down into that a little bit. We've gone from the, the general, what's going on in visualization, sort of broadly how you need to think about it in terms of an application rather than a technology, mm -hmm. to specifically the ways in which this can be applied for, uh, for retail and for, for fashion, for consumers. Um, if you project out the next five years, what is that um, how does how does your visualization technology get integrated into the retail experience? Right. What does that store look like? I think for our, our, for right. me, there's two things that are that are big in e-commerce right now. There's there's the trend of mass customization, which is still a niche, but it's increasing, and some people believe it's huge. And the problem there is, before you buy the product, you actually it's not been made. Right. So uh, so you need good visualization. The second problem in e-commerce for clothing is that most of the things you buy 
are not going to fit you when you get home. And uh, therefore, you'll be disappointed and there'll be, there'll be high returns. Mm -hmm. So both of these things require really good visualization, really good computer graphics. They require computer vision so we can capture the clothing because CAD doesn't exist in the apparel industry. Right. Albert, how does that, how does that relate to what y'all are doing over at, at uh, Volumenta? Right. So I think um, when we think about the retail experience, it's really, uh, it's really related to these sensors that are, that are not yet quite in your pockets. Mm. And so that's one place to reach these consumers. Uh, and uh, you would rather reach them, I think, in, at home, if right. you can. Uh, of course, the, I think the retail stores will never go away. Right. You, al you always will have a need for those. Mm. Um, but then again, even at the, at the store environment, you need the right kind of experience. So most people, for example, are not comfortable with stripping down and like going through something that looks like an airport scanner and so on and so forth, right? right. And that, that's not, I feel already awful about trying three pens. You know, I don't want to go through this extra step again and so on. Um, so I think a lot of that depends on nailing that user experience where the technology is invisible. It's, it's not even part of the conversation. It's like you're, you're there to buy a product and this happens to be the best way of doing it. Right. You don't care if it's computer vision or x-ray. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's also, just fun. I have to say thank you to whoever provided the original visual that was up on, on the screen. That was, that was amazing. That was really incredible and I would have loved to have, have gotten a picture of that for myself. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't bring any uh, demos with jangly guitars because I know y'all, yeah, there it is. Um, de demos with jangly guitars because I know apparently that's the thing. Y'all love the jangly guitars in your, your little animated videos. I think you could go for something a little bit more aggressive considering how forward thinking this conference is, but you know, whatever. I'm not gonna complain. Um, getting back to the point at hand, sorry for my digression. Um, when you think about the entire supply chain or how this gets integrated. Y'all have talked a lot um, on your blogs, respectively, about the notion of, of um, fashion and retail moving from mass production to mass customization. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about sort of the enabling technologies that are going to help move that along, obviously the visualization piece and the scanning piece is one part of it. How do you see that integrating with a broader supply chain to create a new kind of, of, of uh, really a new kind of retail right. market. Well, all the apparent companies uh, love that model. It will be much more efficient. It will be much more efficient for the environment. It will be much more efficient for, for all of us. Uh, but it's, it's a, a very slow process. Right now, the way I think the apparel industry works, there's this 30-30 rule. There's 30% of the clothing is sold, 30% at price, 30% is sold at a deep discount, and 30% ends up in the landfill. That's the business model. If you, if you bring in mass customization, all of a sudden you're talking about having stations that only produce clothing on demand. Right. Therefore, right. you have no waste, right. essentially, especially if you have good visualization. So it could be a revolution. Well, no, but, but you talk about a revolution, and yet the, the, the stores that have been able to implement this most effectively that I've seen, and we, we can talk a little bit more about, about who y'all think have been really good at this, have been sort of bespoke stores mm. that are doing tailoring anyway, high -end but are now stuff, yeah. doing really high-end shit, which, right. you know, frankly, I'm a reporter. I'm too poor to afford that, mm -hmm. and I'd like to be able to afford it at some point. Mm -hmm. So what, what do I do? Like, how does that... How does that happen for me? Like, when, when does it come to my level where I can spend 20 bucks and get, like, a nice shirt? Right. I think we are still quite some time away from that when it comes to, like, getting something customized for entirely customized. Uh, and part of the, I mean, we have part of our team spends a lot of their time in uh, manufacturing, like, ateliers and, and like, uh, like, factories and so on, trying to understand, like, the craft of it. Right. Because a lot of it, of it is historical. And you're trying to sort of digitize something that is maybe a thousand year old, like industry, that shoemaking, let's say. Right. And so we need to, so the, the thing is that we can't just like come up with computer vision algorithms and hope that it sort of, it will work immediately out of the box and they will be able to integrate that into their existing yeah. system. They won't be able I mean, to. But if you look at something like Souls, or you look at something like um, 
what's that earbud company? Normal mm -hmm. here in New York. Mm -hmm. um, well, they're both here in New York, mm -hmm. and um, both amazing uh, right. women but then, entrepreneurs. But then there. again, it's it's coming back to the thing that you said. It's quite expensive. Like right. it's bespoke. It's not like a fifty bucks insole that you can buy. Uh, you need to actually go somewhere. Right. Scan yourself. There's a special machine on the side. That's the right. one thing we know. So there's the mass production area in the factory, and there's a the couple of extra machines that are set on the side for the custom stuff. And those require more work, but they're more profitable. Right. So you just how do you get the volume up on that stuff? Well, I mean, I mean at some point, do y'all envision a world where there are um, 3D printers um, just in-home 3D printers that'll be able to take these scans, someone will customize the clothes, and they'll just print it out. Um, is, is, that, is that a future that you can envision, or is that, is that a pipe dream? Is that science fiction? Um, it's, it's not a pipe dream, but it's quite Jetsons, I would say. Um, Are people too lazy for that shit? It just doesn't <laughs> exist. I mean, it's, it's like you can't really print a shoe at right. home. Um, so... Yeah, so I think the, the but then you can do you can still deliver a ton of value. Right. You don't have to go all the way Jetsons, right. sort of. Uh, to yeah. Well, so who are the uh, George? Who are who are the companies that y'all are working with or that y'all are looking to, who are who are doing this successfully and doing it well? I mentioned Souls. I mentioned Normal mainly because those are the two companies I can think of right now. But, right. But who else do you think? are... Well, for me, uh, I, I see it from a different angle. You're talking about startups doing the new new stuff, really cutting edge stuff that's very small still. Maybe we'll make it big. My experience comes more from we have approached all the biggest brands out there. We've approached them first with the virtual fit idea and trying to digitize their existing lines of clothing and offer a virtual fitting room online. And that idea, it's very hard for them to, they, to understand and fund and take. So we ended up kind of pivoting to the customization piece. And especially it's hard that for, for the more fashion-oriented brands. Uh, so where we found our best business ended up being with companies like Nike and Adidas, who are you know, on the sports apparel, they're very big companies, very technologically savvy. Right. And it turns out that they, they really do have a technological um, edge to them. So we found the, them to be the best adopters of technology. Yeah, but that, that was your previous business model, right? That, that's not the business that you're in currently. Right. So I think in the next one, you go full on, like you go direct to consumer. Right. You don't go B2B with the brands. They will never, uh, you just create essentially uh, a destination where if you want to buy clothes online, you go through there if you want to make sure they fit. And then maybe you get redirected to Amazon or wherever to make the purchase. Hmm. But in order to make sure that it's going to fit, you go through that intermediary. W integration into each of the brands, own e-commerce operation is, is not going to work. So di uh, it, direct to consumer is, 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 in your opinion, the future. It's the Out only there, way you, for the fit side of things. How do, how do you feel about okay, that? So for the fit side of things, right. Not for, do you, do you also mean the, the making the product side of no, things? No, no, no. I mean right. it only for the fit the right, product right. that is made to, made to wear, basically. Right, exactly. So, um, so I think similarly. Um, and another, I think another strategy that we can capture is, is really the, the long tail. And that's all these bespoke um, or like smaller companies, mm -hmm. there are a lot of them right. uh, that you can uh, have really quick rollouts, mm -hmm. get some really quick early adopter use, user base and get also revenues from it and uh, sort of learn from that to uh, catapult yourself to the, to the sort of really, really mass customized future while all, this, all these big giant companies are busy moving their like their various parts. Right. Uh, so that's one thing we are doing. We are working with uh, bespoke uh, manufacturers, for example, in Italy, in Germany, in Denmark, all these places, um, in, in Shuar, and also as of this week in headwear, also in eyewear. Mm -hmm. And 3D printing is, is, is much more doable when it comes to eyewear, for example, than like shoes. Because it's hard like surfaces. Right. Yeah. right. Um, when it comes to making the actual product, that's always something that is hard and um, you are sort of, you will be sort of stuck with one kind of product, whereas the fit solution offers a lot of like different opportunities. Um, 
Yeah, so. Hmm. All right, I, I see you. I'm, I'm feeling you. So uh, when you think about, uh, let's talk some hard numbers now. How much does it cost for a company to implement y'all's solutions? And, and like, what, what's their ROI on stuff like that? How many have you done? You, you say you're working with a number of small, like, how much, what's, what's the time to pay back for these guys? Right, so, for example, I can give one example that is public. Uh, give some private ones. <laughs> just, just a few. I, I would, but I think you, I would not be able to afford <laughs> travel here next year. Um, or be allowed to. Right, uh, right, all right, fine. Um, so, one, one example is... Uh, is a is a is a company that has about twenty stores in in Europe, um, and we did recently a sort of a, and they have their own like shoe masters, right? right? So these are people who sh they are the shoe nerds of right. this world, right? Um, and so, but there are a few of them, so you can't have. So what's ha what happens today is actually is quite interesting, is that this person goes to twenty stores one by one and measures people's feet. Wow, uh, and they spend their life in a plane, basically. Wow. Um, so then they obviously they can't scale. I mean, they are doing pretty well, but they can't scale. Right. Um, and so, what if you could have, you could replace this person with a scanner and so on, right? right. And algorithms and stuff. So we just did a man versus machine uh, competition for that. Uh -huh. Uh, so we had uh, we had the same 150 people, 150. Um, Did shoes. John Henry win? Hmm? John Henry, the guy who was the hammer and the the railroad and the locomotive. Did the guy beat the uh, the the machine? They were they, no, the machine beat the <laughs> beats. The <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> um, so they are quite comparable in in like performance and so on and when it comes to fit, but obviously it's it's a lot more scalable. It's faster and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's one thing that we are doing. And to, to install that into the store is in the low um, or mid hundreds of dollars. Yeah. Um, per, per device or? Per store. Okay, per store. Yeah. Okay. Per device. All right. Yeah. Is um, it one device per store? Typically? Yeah. That's uh, the, the capture time is about like a second. Okay. So in a second, you just... The, so that's the thing. The, the, I think the people shouldn't be even aware that they are being scanned by this you know, like a uh, Star Trek like right. device and so on and so forth. You just like, you just walk in and say, yeah, I want to buy some shoes. And then the, the salesperson there assists you, yeah, so what kind of shoes you are interested in? Please, you know, sit here or whatever. And then in that instant, you are done. Right. Like the, the tech part is done. Right. And I think that's what, what we want to build to make this more like a utility. Mm -hmm. It's not visible. It's just like you turn on electricity, it's there. Right. It's, it's, yeah. So it, does this become a software program? Like, like, do you see this as something that people have the option to sort of download for, for shopping at home? Like, is this, is this right. just in store? Is this a physical retail no. product? Is this. Right. Okay. So obviously, you, once that is done, you can take that data and right. use it to see if a commerce shoe on Amazon would fit you well or not. Mm. So you can take that data anywhere with you. Right. Um, and so our system sort of, we, we built the system to, to allow for that. George, how does that, how does that jive with, with sort of what your thesis is around intervisual? Now that you, you've sort of launched out on this new venture, right. and you've got this new thing going on. So the intervisual idea is to really kind of restart the, the virtual fit idea um, and not well, customization remains with Embody. Uh, Intervisual is more about restarting the original idea of the virtual fit. Therefore, it's about it's a better environment. Um, you know, when we started Embody, it was 2009. It was a very bad year, um, and uh, now a lot has changed. Now we have 3D cameras coming around the corner that's going to be on every tablet on every mobile phone. That means we're going to be able to capture our Ah, look, look at that. That's, That's delicious. <laughs> oh, wonderful guy. Thank you so much. Cheers. I'm making don't a mess. Make, don't make a mess. That means Thanks. we're going to be able to... Um, we're going we're gonna to get rowdy in a second. We're going to get real rowdy. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity as we're dropping cups everywhere <laughs> to say that if y'all want to, uh, to ask questions, I'm, I'm sure someone will be coming around with a mic in the next sort of five minutes or so, but y'all can also tweet at me, um, and I will pose your question based on, on the tweets. Um, and you can tweet at me at at Jay Sheber. That's J S H I E 
B E R. Also, this ups my my uh, follower count, which also looks good. So thanks for that. Perfect. Cheers, guys. Um, I'll get them both in there. Uh, but so but yeah. So let me finish my talk. Please. So yeah. yeah. So um, basically, I think that it it's a moment where we it's probably still worth trying the, the idea. We're seeing what's happening with augmented reality and virtual reality. Something like the HoloLens could be an amazing device to implement the virtual mirror. And the virtual mirror will require some of the same ideas. Digitize the clothing. You're going to need real-time cloth simulation. Um, you're going to need to superimpose it over a real um, image feed of the user. Uh, so I think it's an exciting time, and there's so much buzz around these new technologies. And this could be one of the killer apps. Have you? Have you? Because I I've seen a company actually. I was I was at South by Southwest, um, and I apologize to that company if there's this is a live feed and they're watching me. Um, I forgot their name, but they were doing this virtual mirror. And and I guess my question is, what's the friction around that? You run into that same problem at the store where you're dealing with like taking off your clothes, getting scanned, and it seems like there's a lot of friction there. Is there a way to reduce that process? Do you have the virtual mirror just in the fitting room and you say, you know, just take your kit off once and then right. we'll try on all these clothes? We'll have to figure it out. I think that's what's kind of exciting about it. We, but I think now there's all these new devices and new technologies coming on the market that six years ago there was nothing. It was it was uh, the dark ages. So do you, do you see a <laughs> supply chain for that stuff now? Like, like when you think about the companies that you would partner with, to make this happen, this is one of the one of the totally. areas that I'm, I'm like most Microsoft, interested. Like Microsoft, all the big technology companies, I think, love the concept of this idea. We all understand that there is a problem with shopping online. I don't shop online. There's a reason why I don't shop online is because everything I order doesn't fit me when it mm. comes home because there's no universal sizing. Right. That problem has not been solved. There's been like a hundred startups that have crashed and burned in the last 15 years. We tried it. We had a trial for two years with Hurley. It was super successful from as far as the data, but the business model didn't work. Mm. This was four years ago. Mm. I think now there's technology companies out there, the big top ten names that are starting to realize that what it's going to take to put this to the consumer. Because the consumer wants it. The apparel companies don't care. Mm. So we have to get a technology company to fund and see that yeah. to, to really make it happen. So uh, who's pushing the hardest on that front from, from sort of hardware and enabling technology I perspective? I can't say. Uh, on. <laughs> uh, you must have thoughts, right? I do, of course. Well, come on. Just one. Just Magic Leap doesn't say anything, so I get the <laughs> So if you were to mention some companies that don't talk about what they're doing and are, are pretty impressive when it comes to this stuff... Um, no, I, I'm sorry. Magic I'm sorry. Leap would be one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the HoloLens look pretty. Looks pretty yeah, impressive too. Yeah, that's pretty right? cool stuff. I mean, do you do you see this integrating with um, AR or VR? I think Where it's is... more AR. For me, it's more AR because you can. Um, it's more flexible. VR is really about experiencing um, a presence. Right. I think AR is about mixing things with the real world, obviously. Right. And we're talking about seeing something on your body and trying to decide what you want to purchase and want experiencing a product virtually in a way that um, sells what we call the sensorial chasm. Like one mm -hmm. of the reasons why you don't shop online is like because you're not quite sure. All you're facing is a couple of roller-ass pictures. And that's not always enough to make a decision. But if you have a right. experience... Right. right. And, and how does that play in a volume? So again, what yeah. volumental's role in right. all of those? I think we want to be... So the, the thing about this is that it's really, if it doesn't, it's, it's about like building trust, really. And if it doesn't work, I think consumers are really, really um, quick to say that, oh, this is some gimmicky thing. Like I tried it once, it didn't, it didn't really help, so I will never try this again, maybe in the next 10 years or five right. years. So I think we are trying to be super careful in like, bringing this to the, um, like it shouldn't be like jittery or it right. shouldn't be laggy, it shouldn't be all these things. If your dog runs in front of you, you shouldn't just crap out. You know, all these things. Right. Uh, so, so we turned down, for example, a lot of offers for, um, from handset manufacturers that are right. building these 3D cameras right. into the tablets mm. for fit. They right. came to us and said, you know, we want you to build a fit, Do something, yeah. fit like app for this. Right. But you can and you would probably make some money from that but it would... It would be horrible. Yeah, exactly. Because that's just the first step. The scanning of the body is one of the three important steps. You need the, the content which is the garments. 
Mm. And then you need the visualization, which is the garment on someone's body. Right. And those are difficult problems. Yeah. The body scanning is the easiest. Exactly. And those things are like, uh, and this the same goes for like algorithms and um, like we, what we heard today, I think previously, it's it's almost like that. Uh, I said this before. But it's almost like that scene from that movie, Full Metal Jacket. It's like, this is my algorithm. <laughs> Did there you just <laughs> reference Full Metal Jacket? <laughs> yeah. In a visualization it, conference? It's yeah. like. Uh, you know, there are many others like it, but this one is mine. It's like, this is my deep learning convolution. There are many others like it, but right. this one is mine. You know, right. it's like, wow. it, it's, um, it's really about uh, That's an impressive the experience. Reference, sir. An, impre an impressive reference. Uh, we're, about, we're about five minutes out from the end of the talk. Um, I've seen a few people have followed me, which I, I appreciate, but no one's tweeting at me. <laughs> and I can't believe I've asked all of the questions that I'm supposed to ask. Um, there's, there's one up front. I see one in the back, and then we'll go, we'll go down front. But y'all um, y'all use that technology. It's there for a reason. It makes life simpler, better, easier, happier, more productive. Right, Sir. So, okay. So my question is, when you were uh, replicating that shoemaker, did you actually replicate them independently, or did you, you know, did he have input with his talent? And then what happened to him, actually, eventually? <laughs> Are robots taking over? Did you fire? Did the shoemaker get fired because he wasn't as good as the visualization tech? No, uh, he wasn't getting fired um, because simply he can't be in two places at the same time. We probably um, prevented there there being more shoemakers, if that makes sense. But there wasn't, anyways. So these guys were not able to scale because of that. Um, and the thing is that we really want to, like what we do is that we did is that we sent a couple of people down there and spent some quality time with right. these people and understand how they are. And, under and this is what I mean, that fit is also, like there is no institution in the world that says this is now point, you know, zero one millimeter accuracy, fit, like get your stamp. <laughs> There's no such thing. It's also about like the psychology of, the, right. of of it that you are getting this, you know, you are getting a premium experience and right. you you have this trust that it's going to work and you don't really care. Like I said, if it's computer vision or you are doing some like freaky X-ray thing, um, but it's just that it works. Um, and uh, yeah. So. Okay. Let's uh, move on. We got a question here. There we go. Um, so um, psychology, I think, is the perfect word for my question, which has to do with the virtual mirror. So when I've talked to online retailers about, you know, wouldn't you like to take a 3D model of the, the customer and show them in the clothing, they're all very, very clear, no. They don't and, like and it. They don't like it. And furthermore, you know, some of the smarter ones I've talked to, they've done A-B testing. Right? They, ha they don't necessarily have the 3D model, but they said, look, we show a model in the best possible conditions with beautiful lighting. They look gorgeous. Most of this is women's clothing. The psychology is you want to give them the sense that they're going to look really great. This is great, yes. And I mean, most people don't want to see themselves in 3D. <laughs> like, it's disgusting to see yourself <laughs> in 3D if, you're not, if you don't have the body of Cristiano Ronaldo. Well, we're just wasting time. our time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I want to see myself in clothing before I buy it, but I don't no, think my wife But does. I mean, in, in, in some, in, not, in, not in all cases, I want to like, clarify that, but you get my point. Yeah. No, but this is my goes exactly to what I know that because I've actually lived this for six years and... You're absolutely right about that. The brands don't want that. They want to glamorize. They want the glamour shots. And that's what generates the sales for them. But we have done enough research with consumers. And consumers ultimately want it. It's going to be a utility. And this is why I said it's never going to work with the brands. They're never going to like it. But I think there's ultimately, we as consumers have to take charge. And it's going to take the technology companies, the Microsofts, the Intels, the Googles of this world, to enable this technology to reach critical mass. And then it's all going to be good. Right. But the brands don't want it because their method, the way where they first of all they don't have the funds to to pay for it, and they also don't they're too conservative. Well, but but doesn't there also need to be? A, I'm sorry, is there another question out in the audience? Anyone? Oh, uh, uh, there are a few. There's one over there in the back. We got time for actually only 40 seconds left. Oh no! So I'm going to do my follow-up. Sorry, sir. Um, the the uh, I, it, like 
what is the retailer that that will then, or the the brand company that will come in and say and and sort of disaggregate from the bigger brands and say, look, we want to do this. Like, if it's hardware on one side, what's the? I think it's about aggregation. You basically just drive a truck into any warehouse facility and scan everything in mass. You need a scalable scanning solution. You don't ask anybody. You just go and scan the stuff and build a destination right. that's brand uh, agnostic, if you wish. Right. And to enable that, you need a Google or an Intel to put up the money just to get it going. Uh, and with that, we are actually out of time. Thank you all so much for paying attention. The panelists were great. I was hopefully more than mediocre. And uh, thank, thank you. you so much. Y'all have a good thank one. You. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Nice.